Thank you very much. Um, so my topic is actually about uh, EGGM's computing support uh, in OpenStack and overall in open for uh, the source ecosystem. So uh, it's a review of a project that I uh, co-founded and also started in OpenStack seven years ago. So we will go over the whole journey and uh, have some uh, thoughts for like, future directions. Okay. Uh, so, uh, first of all, uh, I'm from Huawei and uh, now leading the AI operating system open source ecosystem effort in the company. Um, so, the figure uh, at the right uh, bottom side is actually the uh, Open Science Berlin Summit uh, in 2018 uh, was a keynote stage demoing uh, the project. Uh, uh, which is so that's the uh, open source cyborg project. Uh, I was also involved in LVI and uh, also Kubernetes for CCF. Um, yeah, uh, I've been doing open source for a long time. Okay, so this is seven years ago. I'm not sure if you um, could remember. So seven years ago, that was when Google TPU V2 first came up. That was V5. Yeah. Um, that was when Onyx, the first version of Onyx, released seven years ago. And seven years ago, we kicked off the cyborg uh, project. So it's, it has been a long time, and things has like uh, progressed dramatically. Uh, so like I mentioned, I will uh, spend, I think, uh, half of time on cyborg introduction and uh, uh, I will uh, quickly uh, give an overview of the open source uh, AI uh, status, especially uh, relevant to X solution. And also there is uh, absolutely missing piece in AI in front of uh, There's something like nobody or few people are discussing at the moment, and also towards uh, AI native future. Uh, AI native has been a buzzword, but I think most of them are just buzzwords, but I figured something out. Sure. Okay. So, uh, the first part is about the project, uh, the journey of a open source project in OpenStack. It's called Cyborg. Uh, Cyborg is a general management framework for uh, AXA regions. So the word general and AXA regions seems oxymoral for most people. Uh, however, we manage to do it. Uh, so the history of the Cyborg project uh, was kind of really interesting. So seven years ago, or eight years ago, that was when OpenStack was really hot uh, a lot of vendor, a lot of companies try OpenStack and open source their projects. So there were a lot of code dump, we call code dump. So you develop a lot of code in your company and decide to open source it. So a lot of code was dumped in OpenStack. However, the Cyborg project was start from zero. So there is zero code. Um, the idea was actually we borrowed from the standard side of the world because at the time, uh, we were also uh, start drafting uh, token centers at ETSI. So it's called accelerations and general management. Uh, after the standard efforts, we were uh, curious about if we can actually do it in open source, like implementing practically. That's why the Cyborg project started. So it was started just three of us. Um, uh, so we start the design uh, from scratch uh, in OpenStack uh, with many PPGs and summit we discuss over a lot of people. Actually, the name of Cyborg was actually came out from a poll. So it, uh, I didn't name it. I, I gave it an original name called Nomad. So Cyborg was actually a voted name. Uh, the name was proposed by Guy. Uh, from Nice, uh, uh, from US. So as you can see, it's a community-driven project uh, from from startup. Um, so uh, with 
within a year's time, the project grows rapidly, and now it's uh, more or less stabilized. And now the PTL is from Hingzhou, from Eastburn, uh, in China. So it's kind of the big growth. And there's something I love to pull from Stack, uh, stack at the uh, later. Um, the first uh, the first pie chart on the left side is when we started, as you can see, since I'm from Huawei, uh, Huawei's contribution make up a, a big chunk. But one year later, it's actually more diversified. Now, the, chart, uh, the pie chart on the right hand side is the current average of, over the seven years. So as you can see, it's a, it's a really diverse project. And it's not one company, even two companies only. So this is the architecture uh, evolution. Um, so as I mentioned, we, we actually designed the project from, from scratch. Uh, so as you can see, the the left, the the, the original architect uh, architecture of the project was quite simple. Just a couple components, the uh, regular open set component that we talk to the accelerators we can find at that time. But after several cycles, uh, you can see the the, the architecture become more full more and more uh, feature rich. And with the current uh, releases, we have been adding uh, support for uh, FPGA and GPUs uh, a lot. So the, the project uh, is really mature. OK, that was the history. So sort of the journey uh, review of the cycle project. Now I will get into the technical details. Um, the cyborg. Uh, the architecture overview is sort of like the left, uh, uh, no, the right, uh, up hand side. Um, so, from first eye view, is just interacting with Nova, uh, with all the necessary EM application, and interact with placement for scheduling the cyborg itself with a lot of the uh, uh, resource management for for the accelerators. Uh, the bottom right is a more like view of uh, when you actually implement it. So on, on the control node, uh, you will run uh, various uh, open source services. So on the computer node, uh, you will run the cyborg agent, the cyborg a lot of drivers, and through the kernel stack, uh, the cyborg driver will talk to uh, the accelerator uh, response. Um, yeah, and starting U3, I released Noah support uh, creating servers uh, with accelerators and prevention of the server service. And uh, more or less complete the uh, interaction between Noah and Sample. It took uh, uh, several cycles uh, of the VP implementation. So this is a uh, uh, more up to date uh, the workflow. Uh, so we we'll, we will mostly interact with the uh, Cyber API. Uh, the Cyber Agent is the one that on the computer actually talk uh, to the accelerator device, and uh, placement serves as a uh, middleman between Nova and Cyber. This is a more uh, detailed interaction. Uh, I won't uh, go into too much detail. Uh, however, you can see uh, it uh, more or less uh, are similar to how Noah interact with Neutron. Okay. Uh, on the left hand side, and on the right hand side is uh, a detailed view of like uh, what side work uh, we port, uh, things like last time, last flavors. So. We report those kind of information to placement to lower for the resource allocation. Okay, uh, next I'm going to uh, give an overview of uh, several kinds of accelerator support at the moment. In Cyborg, well, the first uh, that the, the, uh, everyone wanted is the GPU, right? 
uh, uh, for Cyborg specifically, since uh, the support of GPU in Nova and also in Ironic started pretty early on, so there's no problem if you just have one car and you want a dedicated GPU support for your for your VM. Yeah, that, that's that's accomplished a long time ago. However, if you want to use uh, vGPUs and also Linux, the more new type of uh, GPU virtualizations alongside with physical GPUs. That, uh, that's where Cyborg uh, came in, actually. So as you can see, you, you can use Cyborg to provision the, the physical GPU. Uh, the difference between using Cyborg and using Ironic uh, is that with Cyborg, you, you could do like more uh, nuanced uh, control and provision uh, for your GPU since Cyborg is designed to like automatic information code device. Um, but for uh, GPUs and Linux, I think it's this job of composing Cyborg and Nova to do together and to help uh, you to provision those virtualized uh, GPU resources and also uh, to the virtual machine. And another tenant uh, is uh, the difference between local and remote. This is also a, a big differentiating part for Cyborg. Um, so we used to have like GPU resources mostly local, right? But now with a lot of uh, uh, things over Ethernet, a lot of protocol have been matured over the seven and eight years uh, remotely attached accelerators become more and more uh, uh, like, uh, functional and uh, desirable. So the ability to uh, have your local, uh, locally attached accelerators as well as remotely attached accelerators managed together, this is also a differentiating point for sideboard. Uh, get back to the general management. So this is also very important. Uh, if you have like remotely attached uh, or RDMA uh, GPU arrays, uh, Cyborg is your go-to choice. Okay, the second one is more like network related. So uh, it's FPGA and smarting. Um, so. Uh, standing now, seven years later, I think Cyborg is still the only open source uh, cloud management project that you can use to create an FPGA instance on your open set Um It's a bit sad, but I think Cyborg is still the only one. So we put a lot of effort working with Intel people. With, so that was when Intel acquired uh, Altera. So we worked with Intel people, with Xynix people, that was before Xynix was purchased by AMD, uh, to add FPGA support, uh, Cyborg provide a, uh, a programming API uh, for the administrators. So you, you can just call the API and burn the image you want on the FPGA, FPGA device. That's pretty neat. That's, that was actually the demo we did uh, at the, uh, the Open Cyborg Summit uh, six years ago. And SmartNix, a lot of SmartNix, uh, now we call it DBUs. So a lot of SmartNix are actually FPGA based. Um, so if you want a more nuanced management of your SmartNix, meaning that uh, you want, like, for example, forming different uh, uh, programmable uh, network functions into different regions of, of the FPGA on your SmartNix, uh, that's where you use Cyborg. So you can use Neutron to do that. Neutron typically help you set up with all the tunnels and the networks and the sub, uh, but the management of the SmartX could be the, the Cyborg. Okay, the third one, the storage, uh, and then the attached SSDs. So as I mentioned in GPU session, so, um, 
the locally attached versus uh, the locally attached, and how you provide a general management for both types uh, will be, uh, has been like more and more important and will be more and more important in the future as well. Um, so uh, I've been familiar with the NVMe standard effort. Um, so for NVMe attached SSDs, both locally attached and remotely attached, you could also do a lot of very detailed and nuanced management other than just attach the SSD and write data on it, right? For example, the NVMe or Fabric uh, protocol actually support you uh, to do a, 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 a region cleans uh, upon uh, several conditions. This type of functionality, like the burning program onto the FPGA is uh, very critical for how uh, admins uh, if you want to provide a really good uh, and fine brand and service support. So currently, uh, also sadly, Cyborg is also the only project that, that I am aware of provides such uh, management. Um, yeah, so uh, I go over the three major scenarios. Uh, as you can see, for a single project, provide a unified management plan for use for SmartX and for NME based SSDs. That's pretty unique. That's where Cyborg uh, shines upon. So this is the future directions that I have in mind um, uh, for, for Cyborg or for uh, observations in general. The first one is uh, I think we want to make Cyborg independently deployable, meaning it should not be tightly coupled with Nova and placement or other uh, services uh, too much. So similar to Ironic, I think uh, Cyborg should be should be able to deploy uh, independently. Uh, it will help a lot of the companies that actually need uh, to manage all the shenanigans of the power servers and hardware is more easy. And also, uh, I've also been involved in the accelerator support in Kubernetes, uh, but I'm more uh, in the maximum. So uh, if you are familiar with the cognitive support of accelerators, uh, you know that it was also miserable. Uh, the DRA uh, well, is way better than the device plugin before. But the 2.0 is kind of a setback from our point of view uh, because the RA 2.0 kind of move all the scheduling, all the functionalities in tree, uh, which means on the pro side, uh, the Kubernetes plus GPU will uh, get more official support. Uh, production grid will be uh, more good. But the concept is that if you have any hardware other than GPU, it will be increasingly difficult for Kubernetes to support hardware. So it, it was always, uh, always like my desire that the lab figure to have Kubernetes, to have an operator, to have an auto band, control band, for the accelerators, and for the cyborg, and talk to a CRV to do that. So in the middle, uh, so we want Cyborg to be able to support more accelerator types. Uh, we are in a golden age of uh, accelerators, actually. So you have a lot of risk five based ASICs, right? You have talk from uh, Furiosa AI. Uh, I'm very interested in that company with the new AI hardware from South Korea. Uh, Grok, uh, Cere uh, Cerebras from UK, US, and also like if you're into blockchain or something like that, recent uh, technology directors like Jay Cheese and uh, ZKs, which both require a dedicated uh, accelerator to accelerator components. Uh, and also the new bus types. So the protocols are actually the thing Cyborg uh, cares about much. CXL, uh, we have Kathy before, I don't know if Kathy is still alive now. And also, like uh, any of the innovative bus 
protocol uh, needs to be supported in Cyborg. And uh, on the crossers uh, uh, view, uh, both support skill up and skill up. Skill up really means uh, using the and uh, switch uh, on a single node to skill up uh, uh, your accelerator. From skill up, I mean, like having larger uh, clusters, uh, like via RDMA, uh, we have open source alliance now on UEC, right? And also, uh, the right hand side is metadata, which I think is one of the most important output from Cyborg that we actually define a metadata sort of standard to describe with a lot of uh, accelerators. And, uh, uh, I think we need to like, standardize it. Okay, so if the previous slides motivate you, uh, please, uh, the projects are already. Needed a proper blueprint from our PTL uh, at the moment, and also we got to report and stuff on sort sort work and then we help it. Okay. Uh, okay. I spend most of the time uh, explaining cyborg to you. Now it's more future stuff. Okay. Since I'm leading open source AI, actually, the public, um, the open source LLMs has been everywhere, right? So that's the most recent figure with Lama 405 b came out. Uh, amazing. Um, I actually do have a dedicated slide to talk about all the open source LMS, but that's a hundred pages long, so I won't be given that today. But if you are interested, you can ping me so we can arrange <coughs> online seminars for that. But related to accelerations, uh, there are just three coordinates I want to mention here. So the open source LLM has been uh, like supporting uh, really uh, like smaller bits. Uh, that figure, the, the left figure was from the tri uh, project or paper that you can find it on GitHub. So now uh, the support for uh, like ternary um, LLMs are growing like more and more uh, prominent. The second one is uh, absolutely growing uh, like faster, and uh, we see a lot of uh, accelerations, um, KB cache uh, processing, and also like memory <coughs> processing, and also Q as well, and also broader deployment. Uh, other than server. Uh, you usually think about server, uh, cluster, uh, you can also use browser uh, for LMS. There are a lot of people are developing the JS, and there's a lot of support for LMS, right? However, something that is a miss. Uh, if you really love uh, the papers coming out on archive every day, not every month, just every day, uh, you find quite interesting that all the optimization on target and compute, more specifically target and GPU compute, right? How I can save a lot of GPU memories, how I, how I can save a lot of GPU compute. So the question is that as the cloud computing industry, we are in, we used to like optimize for simple things like forwarding table. So forwarding table will have a dedicated hardware for it. So what happened to that? One step, right? Uh, we used to think about if there is a problem, let's use hardware to accelerate that problem solve, solve right? So uh, that's where I think really problematic is that the current infrastructure is still very computing centric, meaning all the data, including models, are uh, like uh, concentrated CPU and GPU and we are all dying to figure out how to save memory, save bandwidth, save compute um, from the compute center. However, uh, I think the, the right way or the, the ways that it should be is that 
take lama 405b, for example, right? The weight itself is eight, is more than 800 gigawatts. So it should be that we have a large model, I have a large data set, to sitting there and we design a lot of accelerators with a lot of focus on various functionalities and help with the data and either training, the inference, the data processing. Um, so I think this is to actually be the way. It, uh, it was the way in the computing area, but I think this was somewhat missing. But I think this should be a great direction to go to for the whole industry. Okay, now comes the question. Nobody is stupid, right? Why have not shift to that direction? There's a really uh, simple answer. For example, the cost of GPUs at not in advertise. Right, it's very expensive to purchase GPU. Where do we have the budget to buy other places up? And more importantly, uh, you you persuade me to buy a lot of accelerators and energies. How 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 do I use it? Right. So here comes my another proposal. This is actually four, uh, five years ago. Um, and something I, I still keep in mind. So I. I, I want to propose something like uh, open heterogeneous computing framework um, that actually we have a open source project integration reference stack to support different uh, scenarios, although now it's mostly a kind of thing as a target scenario. So something like that. Uh, if you're working uh, worked in telco area, you might be familiar with the project of OPMB. So the concept was uh, really similar to OPMB. Um, so we are now doing a new open source project rather to correctly integrate a lot of open source projects you will use when you use uh, accelerators and provide the reference implementation so that if you want to go the data-centric direction, you know that when you have a lot of accelerators, you have a reference architecture uh, to implement it. So here's an example of such set. So take AI, for example. Um, everyone is like uh, renting the compute from the cloud, so I think few people ever bother with the uh, lower layers, but actually if you want to build it yourself from ground up, you'll have maybe five base chips to uh, make accelerators and make accelerators into OCP to find racks. And then on that, you do provision of newer, which is a great open source operating system. And with open newer based deliverables, you can provision open cycle or Kubernetes for both, uh, whatever you want. And then you want to run AI workloads, right? Everyone is using a llama now, but just a, a uh, wrapper for uh, Docker, uh, you can Docker as, as Docker as well. So in that container, what you are running is actually a model written in some framework, right? So PyTorch is the go-to, but we do have new projects like MySport from our company, uh, open source deployment frameworks, and also Telegraph from Geofox. And you have a lot of open source tooling to do fine tuning. And then you have the models pulling from plugin phase. And uh, you have a new project called Moxin to help you do a lot of inference stuff. So this could be the reference set that saves you a lot of money, well, costs you a lot of uh, time in work, but really saves you a lot of money uh, if you want to do that. Uh, so Mark Collier actually asked, uh, to know about Moxin, so I uh, uh, prepared the slides just for that. So Moxin is a project from our friend, actually, not, not from Huawei directly. Um, but it's, uh, if you're using LM, uh, LM Studio on your computer, this is a open source version of it, basically. Uh, and it's written in Rust, so it's very performant. Um, my time is up, so let me rush to the end. Okay, AI yeah, native. Everyone will be talking about AI yeah, native. So boring. But my 
suggestion is that AI native actually means Python. So if you are familiar with cloud, history of cloud native, cloud native is actually gigantic ecosystem right around what? Gola. If you think about Red Docker, Gola, Kubernetes, Kubernetes was originally written in Java, in Java in Google, but rewritten in Gola. So cloud native was a great effort to build a open source ecosystem around a programming language. I think now with what I see uh, in the world, it might be the time for Python. Um, fortunately, unfortunately. Um, so Python, we used to use it only for frameworks, right? For data, there, there has been data science using Python for decades. And now recently, about LLMs and agent also written in Python, which we thought it could be it should be written with JavaScript more, but Lama Index, um, Longchain, a lot of great, great projects actually written in Python. And now, even the hardware runtimes are written in Python now. This is where things get really interesting. So Calden from uh, uh, a company called Hexerloop, um, and Mojo from uh, Chris Lama, right? Of the LLM, uh, LLVM thing. So those two are the highly performing Python optimizations uh, that you can find now. Uh, didn't exist before. The downward two are the Triton from OpenAI, which is basically a, a, a Python-based DSL uh, upper layer of CUDA. But NVIDIA doesn't like see idle as well. NVIDIA has been trying to develop the work block, which is their version of the Python implementation of the CUDA. So I think uh, if you ask me what is the identity of the use Python, it will be a gigantic new open source ecosystem right around Python, just like the cognitive right around Poland. Okay. So, uh, talked a lot and uh, over time. I think uh, I want you to bring back from my talk is the data oriented acceleration is the future. Uh, don't be tied to the compute centric man uh, mindset. Uh, let's be with a great of the uh, community. And also, if you're interested, feel free to contact me about the, uh, the Open Future Genius Computer Framework, uh, the initiative I talked about to have open source reference architecture. Actually. Okay, that's it. You can find me on X. I'm active on Twitter, despite all the difficulties, and uh, also email. The font is not so it's blue, sorry. So you can contact me on Twitter or email. Thank you so much.